Cabot. Welcome to World War One X. And we're here with Professor Heath Cabot from the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the invitation. And um, in all these interviews, the first, to get right into it, you know, the first question we ask is, how did you become an anthropologist? Tell us about your pathway to anthropology. So I didn't major as an anthropologist. I didn't major in anthropology. Um, I came to anthropology through a kind of really nerdy fascination with ancient Greece and Egypt. I mean, like many kids, I would just like read the mythology, and I, I just happened to take it through college, and I kept sort of doing that. So I did classics and religious studies, and I was really interested in, um, you know, I guess ideas of, of culture, but I didn't really know the terms to describe it, uh, uh, to, to use to describe it. So for instance, um, I've spent, I spent like my entire undergraduate career worrying about you know, what, why was this ancient cult in this place at, at this, in Olympia, Greece, right? Okay, and it doesn't sound like one of these big topics, but people have spent a lot of time worrying about it. And then I just happened to read a text. It was actually segmentary lineage and all that, all like right. Evans Pritchard, and I was like, this is so great. <laughs> this helps me interpret this, all of this material I've been worrying about. So, um, yeah, my, my undergraduate mentor said, you know, if I could do it again, I would have done anthropology. So... I think that was part of it. I felt it was like a, actually a way that would allow me to understand some of the things that had been puzzling me. I don't know if that's actually what ended up happening. But I think the other thing was after spending many, like my whole undergraduate career in a library, I really wanted to get out. Um, and, you know, well, you can look at an ancient text or you can talk to people. And I think I'm, I'm, I was pretty excited to talk to people a little bit more. But I think some of the questions are similar, right? Like people, historians, religious studies people, classicist. I mean, we're all interested in kind of what makes what makes people tick and the specificities of that particular time, but also the things that, you know, we can relate to across eons, I guess, maybe. So, that's and, and anthropology, I mean, <coughs> history is a big part of anthropology, so mm -hmm. you, you did the groundwork first, so <laughs> well totally. done on that. No, and but it's interesting because I work in Greece, and so actually Greece is the uh, continu uh, kind of continuous <laughs> thing in my life, actually. I was going to ask, was that, was that based on the classics and, and you wanted to go and... Totally go to Olympia and, and find the yeah, ruins? Yeah, you know, I, I started my graduate work and it was like, well, the first thing we were asked to do was come up with a project, because I, I, I went to a U.S. program and, you know, there's this very open-ended, it depends on the program, of course, but it was clear that I didn't have to have a project when I applied, so I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll do something in Latin America, like, I have no idea. You can learn languages, um, U.S. programs are seven years, sometimes six years, at least five, so there's time to learn a new language, but, um, we're like, got to write a project, got to get a grant in there, first week. So I, so I thought, okay, I'll just go to Greece, and, and, and I went, and I was fascinating, completely different than anything I'd expected, but yeah. And how did you get to working with refugees in Greece? What was the, from, from the ancient tales, yeah. the tragedies, right. the dramas, to the modern day right. dramas and tragedies? So, <clears throat> actually, that was a really, that's a nice connection you drew that I hadn't really thought about. Well, I guess I had thought a little bit about. Um, so when I first went to Greece, I was very interested in doing stuff on like ancient history or the uses of history, et cetera, which, of course, Michael Hertzfeld has already done, and no one really needs to do very much more work on that, um, as far as I'm concerned in anthropology. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. When I went to Greece for the first time, it was like two, it was 2004, so during the Olympics, and there had been a lot of talk about. Know, people coming in from Iraq and Afghanistan because this was, you know, things had just spiked and, and people started noticing people coming in. Um, and so that was a huge, people were talking about it and there was a lot of concern, I would say anxiety, a lot of like disorientation about what's going on here. Greece had had a lot of migration in the late 80s and early 90s, Albanian migration, but these were people coming from, you know, war-torn countries, looked a little bit different in many cases than Greeks. Um, but I think the larger thing that was always interesting to me was how the Mediterranean, and I remember looking at maps of the ancient world, you know, as a, an undergrad, and thinking about, well, wow, how close and intimate these countries are, these spaces. I mean, Europe wasn't, ex there was no Europe, there was no, it, it was the Mediterranean basin and all the connections between that. So I guess in some ways my work has been looking at how those connections persist despite all of the work that goes into actually trying to stamp them out and preserve this idea of Europe that has actually become very violent. And so, yeah, I think, I, I believe that the Mediterranean is very interesting for those reasons for how it makes us think differently about geography, about space, about identity. 
Um, so yeah, I think that was also a very important thing, and migration is a very clear way into those kinds of questions. It's actually a, a, a radical rethink, um, certainly growing up in Europe. Europe is this, the continental base, right? right? But actually, looking back in history, it's the Mediterranean, it's a seafaring, it's a, you know, a migratory exactly. space rather than this bordered and, and, and very static space that we exactly. know as Europe now with Frontex and, and very... <laughs> Um, violent borders, as you say. Absolutely. And actually, a, a Bradell, I don't know if he, it's wonderful, people should read Bradell, I think. He talks about the movement of the sort of seat of power in this mm -hmm. larger world that wasn't about Europe, it was about, you know, tr stretching to China and, <laughs> okay, but the Atlantic really hadn't come in the picture yet, and the sort of seat of all of this trade and interaction had been the Mediterranean and the Black Sea and all of these interconnected regions, but then then the Atlantic eventually took over, you know, as, as a site of power, and that kind of just changed everything in a way that, you know, of course he's not thinking about the Pacific, <laughs> but um, the way that, you know, our geographies shifted in this really mm. profound way, but it wasn't an accident, you know, it was, a, it was economic, political power. That, so. And before we get more into your, yeah. your, your research, one other question we always ask is, is we, we ask anthropologists to define anthropology. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what is anthropology to you, either as methodology or as, as, mm -hmm. as discipline, mm -hmm. uh, and how do you use it? I remember, can I just preface my response to this? And you can... Sure. Um, by, I, I actually, uh, my, the position I used to teach in there, when I interviewed there, it's a teaching position, and um, I, I had a lot of fun preparing that job talk, and I started, uh, started the whole the, the talk by saying, um, you know, people in the field, when I'm doing my field work, always ask me, what's anthropology? And <laughs> I always have so much trouble answering that, and I remember one of my field interlocutors, who's a lawyer, saying, you know, I'm a lawyer. I can describe what a lawyer does. Isn't it a little weird not to be able to describe your profession? And I will say that <laughs> and I, I sort of wonder why that's so difficult. I think sometimes it's, especially when you work in Greece, people think you're like an archaeologist if you say anthropology, then you have. So, so it's interesting to think about like what anthropology means to people in the world. Like what does it stand for? Or people even think about it at all. Anyway, so I think it's really cool that we're thinking about that. I'm trying to publicize that a little bit. For me, anthropology um, has as its project what a lot of other social scientific projects are, but that's to understand people and how they react, interact and relate to each other and the worlds around them. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, I think we're looking for both durable, let's say, not unchanging, but durable kinds of ideas or patterns of behavior and thinking, um, but also change and, and sometimes very radical change um, but I, for me, the thing that I think is very specific about anthropology is ethnographic method, which anthropologists aren't the only people who do, but I think anthropologists do it in a very intense way. In ethnography, I think of it, well, it's, based, it's basically learning about people by spending time with them and thinking in a somewhat systematic way about those interactions. And so um, the idea is to really get in, you know, the idea is to really immerse yourself and all that, but it's, it's true, I mean, I, you know, I learned Greek, <laughs> you know, I think the question of what, 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 um, what distinguishes anthropology from journalism is a really fair question, um, and I think there are journalists who can end up doing work that's very deep and very, very um, rigorous, um, anthropologists who write for other, um, other kinds of venues, but I think, you know, that idea that you actually really need to know something about a site before you even try um, to enter it, and then when you enter it, <laughs> you realize you just still don't know anything at all. And everything changes. <laughs> exactly, and I think, you know, I think there's a kind of, I mean, I recently started a new project, and I feel like a baby half the time, and that's part of, I like that cultivated humility um, that anthropology is really about, and yeah. So what happened when you went into the field in 2004? What, what changed, or what, what mm. how did your expectations of what your project was going to be get um, surpassed by events and, and things that you saw. Interesting. So I think I didn't have a lot of, I wasn't a grad student who had a grandiose idea of what I was going to do and then I got there and realized I couldn't do it. I was pretty convinced it was already going to be very, very difficult, um, that the language was going to be exhausting. I, I started learning modern Greek um, 
it, uh, as a grad student, I worked really, really hard. Um, but I'm going to say this. I mean, it, there's also a thing that anthropologists don't talk about. We just assume everyone can like speak Hindi or whatever at an academic level. No, there are there are layers, and it takes time to mm. learn another language. And even though you may know, I mean, even it takes time to learn your own language mm. um, and to relearn it. So I think you know that's also very um, exhausting. I think the thing that I hadn't been prepared for. You know, I had this idea that I'd work, you know, do stuff around refugees. I, I wasn't prepared for the exhaustion and um, just sheer devastation of some of the, the things I was seeing and hearing. And you know, I, I don't even like to dwell on it very much because I know that I, I think it just turns into war stories at a certain point. And I, I know that my field work it was in a bureaucratic environment. I was working with lawyers. Um, but at a certain point, I remember I got I got so tired and I would go to sleep at six, and you know, I wouldn't want to get up, and it became really, really, I was unprepared, I think, for the amount of social exhaustion that it generated. And it wasn't just working with refugees. Mm. It was talking to everybody about anything and um, being constantly open in this way that made me very, very vulnerable um, in a way that I needed to do, but also it was really hard. Um, and uh, yeah, I think. But I think that's a really important insight because a lot of anthropologists, you know, once once we come out of the field and we start writing, we kind of either push it aside or try to forget. And oh, it wasn't that bad. Now I'm writing, and it's all been worth it. Yeah. But I think, in in the moment in the field, it is very exhausting because yeah. you, you're always collecting data. You're as you say, yeah. you're always open to potentialities. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, new new lines of inquiry. Uh, every every discussion, mm -hmm. you you know, you always have to be there. Mm -hmm because that's your job. Yeah. Um, exactly, that's it, your job, to be open. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we do. Yeah. But it, as you say, same, same in my field. It gets very exhausting very quickly, yes. and you, you need breathers. And I think with, with my grad students, I try to tell them to take some time off in the middle. And, so and <laughs> read a novel for a week, run a movie. Well, I, I, think, I think that's actually a lot of anthropologists do that very poorly, yeah. um, because we're always on. <laughs> Everything's always something we can think about yeah. and talk about. So I've, I've sort of not stopped watching the news, but I watch less of the mm -hmm. news because I'm always thinking, and oh, well, how does it relate to yeah. it? Um, and especially with something as current as the refugee crisis, and you know, I'm yeah. uh, putting them in, because it's a crisis narrative, and you've written about this. You yeah. know, this, you know what, what role do you think anthropology has in dispelling some of the myths of crises, narratives that, we're, you know, that the media always puts on in terms of refugees, in terms of immigration, because mm -hmm. um, I think anthrop that's part of mm. the work that we do, yeah. that we have this wealth of knowledge to dispel mm -hmm. some of these ideas that are circulating. Um, well, I, I should say that I'm at a kind of strange moment um, in terms of what I think anthropology does, um, because I do think it has a role. I don't think there's just one role um, that it can have in understanding um, sort of what's going on in a world that's very unjust and always has been, but is also amazingly beautiful in so many ways. And um, I think I've become very, uh, I would say, cynical about um, the language of crisis and particularly um, the idea of what's current and exciting in anthropology. Mm -hmm. I, I was, um, when I started my grad work, and this is, I sometimes wonder if I'm just being like defensive about my work, and, and I'm saying that because. Um, I don't know, this is, but this is the only way that I relate to it. When I first started out working in Greece, people were like, why refugees? Why in Greece? I mean, people were like, Greece? Why is that even interesting? And I, you know, I'm going to say it's very hard for people who do research in Europe to get jobs. There's, a lot of, like, not, there's not a lot of interest in, <laughs> I mean, people say, oh, it's great that you work in such and such a place. But you know, there is, it's harder. So, so there are places that are more interesting on a global scale than other places. And I would say Greece, ancient Greece is very interesting and important. Contemporary Greece for a while there was like a place you go on vacation and, you know, it was maybe a little bit pretty disorganized, especially if you were coming from Europe, the, Europe, Northern Europe or something like that. So um, anyway, um, you know, I did research on this thing that was very clearly, it, I'm not talking about me, the people who were working on ad, trying to do advocacy to sort of Hey, look, Greece is becoming like the Arizona of Europe. Mm. How are we going to deal with this? And how are we going to deal with this not just as, as Greece and, and people in the NGO world, but like all of Europe? How are we going to deal with that? People didn't really want to hear about it. And I think it's really interesting that you have what's become a crisis 
it's not that there weren't any warning signs 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And I think that's why I, I applaud um, anthropology now. You know, I've been asked to write all sorts of things in the past year about this. And um, you know, I'm thinking, well, actually, I think what's really important is to look at things that may be crises in the making, mm. but that we're not necessarily, they're not, they're not at the, in the center of global attention. And I think one thing that anthropology does really well is it looks at things that can be, look really banal or maybe unimportant and you know, maybe show that they're extraordinary and interesting, maybe show that they're actually really banal and difficult. But I think, I don't like, I think it's important to be contemporary, but I also think we have to be critical about what that contemporary is. Because usually by the time there's a crisis, like New Orleans, <laughs> okay, um, Flint, Michigan, it's a bit too late to actually deal with it. So I think anthropologists have to stop tracing the limelight and actually look at stuff that, you know, do what they do really well. Um, and but also pay attention, obviously. So if that makes sense, I think the idea of crisis is this kind of, it, it, it seems like it comes out of nowhere, but really there's a history and it's, it's okay, I can say there's a history, but I don't know how that helps <laughs> in trying to ameliorate real problems. So. But I mean, on that Does point, that make sense? it makes sense. But on that point, why do you think it is that anthropologists anthropologists aren't heard until the crisis has, you know, made it into the the limelight, if you like, and and until the media is caught up with the emerging crisis or mm -hmm. the issues? Because there's issues all over the world. Um, right. But at, you know, at what point do they become breaking news or? get to that point. Well, I think a lot of people would say that anthropologists sometimes write or uh, produce work that is hard for people to understand. Now, I think that's true. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think anthropology, I mean, some people can write in different ways. I think, um, I think part of the reason anthropologists aren't heard is the same reason that people, act, advocates and activists aren't heard, is that people don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, I'm more and more convinced that actually, you know, people know what's wrong. I mean, I know where my clothing comes from. Mm. It's a lot more convenient not to do anything about it. I mean, I think there's a lot. <laughs> so, so, so on the one hand, I, I think it's really important for anthropologists, like ever, you know, to find other ways of communicating. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of collaborative work in the field. I, um, I do like continuing education kinds of things. I engage with lawyers. I'm on the board of like, of an NGO, um, I, uh, I t really try to do those things in my field site. I'm not sure, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think there's space for all different kinds of anthropology and I think that teaching is another way in which, you know, different kinds of education. Um, teaching is a really important part of the work that we do. Um, students who are going to maybe think critically, ask different kinds of questions, I do believe in that. But I also think we have to continue the project of being disciplined and, and systematic and kind of slow with some of the work we're doing mm -hmm. um, and make sure we're actually not just reactive because some, sometimes the <laughs> sometimes we need to like really plan and, and see what's really going on before and sometimes and that takes time and sometimes it takes pages and sometimes it takes theory and sometimes it's not easy to read mm -hmm. um, but you know people aren't stupid like people can read and think in a complex way um, not just anthropologists, everybody. And I think there are many different ways of engaging with people, and it doesn't have to in involve necessarily a watering down of the, the more academic aspects of anthropology. It's a great rally cry. Um, <laughs> do you, we've talked a lot about anthropology and the discipline and how we do what we do. Yeah. Let's get back to the meat okay. of, yeah. of your research. Can you tell us a bit about the, the work? So starting 2004, your, your work with refugees yeah. and... and, yeah, and and you worked with an NGO in, in Athens yes. that works with refugees. Mm -hmm. So tell us about how you got into that field and, yeah. and how you negotiated you know, your work there and, and, and what you found. Okay, well thank you for that question because um, I haven't actually thought about my older field site for a little while even though I'm in frequent contact with them. This was an NGO that had been doing refugee work since like the early 90s and so it, it, before there was any talk of a crisis when Greece finally orig originally started resettling refugees, so, um, or even before that actually. And, um, and so I had visited actually in one of my early in summer field work thinking, wow, this would be really interesting. And it was kind of on a whim, like I'll just get in touch. And they were really welcoming. I mean, they're in general very welcoming with researchers. They get a lot of researchers coming in. Um, and it was so interesting because I, I mean, they were just, they're, they're, looking at these encounters between lawyers who were trying to help 
um, refugees, asylum seekers, whatever term you want to use. And then the kinds of just difficult ways in which that whole encounter unfolded was, was extraordinary. Um, and the ways in which people were asked to tell their stories, the role of interpreters, the fact mm. that, the, that, that uh, one of the main things I looked at in my book and also during my fieldwork was how lawyers who's, who saw themselves as advocates really ended up taking on a role as of screening and rejecting the vast majority of the people who were coming there because, you know, as a lawyer, you want to take on cases that have a chance. Um, and so that sort of screening role became really, really complicated and interesting. Um, I think the thing that I um, hadn't expected really was how, how close I would become with them. Um, I, I think a lot of anthropologists see themselves as, and I think, I mean, obviously my larger project is to try to you know, think about ways in which people looking for protection can, can actually get some kind of sustainable, meaningful access to a livable life, mm -hmm. um, hopefully a good one even. Um, but um, I think a lot of anthropologists myself included, I imagined I'd be sort of hanging out with refugees, and I did, right? I mean, I, I definitely moved around and, and developed enduring friendships with people who, who are refugees or come from a refugee background, but I really found myself, I, I mean, I, I, was, I was very in, embedded in this, this community of lawyers, and I think there was a lot that was very uncomfortable about that. I didn't enjoy <laughs> what they were doing. They didn't enjoy what they were doing, and I think the sort of central thing I looked at in my book were these kinds of ethical dilemmas that people um, we're, we're dealing with, like how do you reject someone that, but then maybe try to find a way to help them on the other end of things. Um, so yeah, and, and, and really these amazing enduring friendships have emerged from that and, and, and I sometimes find myself like almost an apologist for people who are in positions of power because I think, um, I, I think it's, it's very easy to discount the extraordinary ways in which things that are so much bigger than them actually constrain what they're able to do and how people keep showing up sometimes without hope, without believing in their work, and try to find ways, like mm -hmm. small ways. They might be completely seem very meaningless, but they might make a difference in one person's case. And I think that is a difference. So anyway, that was kind of mm. how that ended and, up going. And, and, and one of the aspects you're, you were writing about is, is solidarity. And mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting that in, mm -hmm. in the midst of the, the narrative of pushbacks of boats, mm -hmm. of, of early on, of the violence, that there's also networks of solidarity and, and as mm -hmm. you were just saying people try to help and the, the internal contradictions of that mm -hmm. working for and working with mm -hmm. and and your ethical position in that mm -hmm. can you tell us a bit more about solidarity in Greece okay so one thing uh, so since people probably know about that there was a massive debt crisis and the, the, the mechanics of crisis, that the financial yeah. crisis and that was a global thing um, but Greece it was very like, peculiarly positioned in that and as a result because they weren't able to sustain their sovereign debt the country's debt um, uh, to their diverse debtors um, they've been made to adopt austerity policies of different kinds which means sort of cut, cut massive cuts in pensions basically the whole social state is being dismantled in a very intentional and, and technocratic way by the IMF, <laughs> European Commission, and um, European Central Bank. So these are not just policies that happened out of nowhere. This is another thing about crisis. We talk about crisis, it sounds like it came out of nowhere. Well, no, these are, these are policies that are being like, enforced. So this is really, what, what was so interesting to me is that I was looking at sort of NGOs and then other sort of charitable maybe organizations that had been working with um, uh, asylum seekers, refugees, people who were clearly on the or at least marked as being on the outside, mm. as on the outside, and then and then and then citizens started showing up to these places, mm. and more and more, and, and you start seeing more and more people homeless. And, and it actually takes a lot to become homeless in Greece. It's not a very rich country, but people care about property and take care of their families and friends. So I started asking, well, what's happening here? I've been looking at what people think is the antithesis of the citizen, the refugee, but really, like the whole the whole realm. Like citizens themselves is or don't have access to livable livelihood anymore, and, and it's interesting because in, in Europe, like that matters. I mean, one of my interlocutors in Greece makes the point that well, you know, in the U.S., that's just how you live, right? Like it's like constant austerity. Um, so I've I've been looking. Um, so anyway, there are these really interesting and very radical. Um, sometimes I would say politically, but radical in the kinds of practices they use. Um, social movement, I guess, but but really um, organized. I would call it organization, um, redistribution networks is what mm. I call it. P citizens, neighborhood, neighbors, 
friends, maybe not friends, who've gotten together and said, wow, like people don't have access to medicine or food or housing or education. What can we do? And so the goal, I've been looking at um, these pharmaceutical redistribution networks. Um, the, basically, you look in your medicine cabinet, let's say, or so let's say your grandmother dies, and then you bring in, you say, oh, well, someone else can use this. And you bring this to another place, and people go through it. And the, there'll be a pharmacist, a volunteer pharmacist. All the labor's voluntary. And it'll be given to someone else who needs it. And so it's really taking this sort of waste that's generated through this, these systems and redistributing in a way that makes, makes sense for people, but, um, or that's meaningful for people. Um, what's interesting um, to me about it is the idea of solidarity. So, what it might sound like or look a lot like um, different forms of, let's say, humanitarian aid. Mm. I mean, sometimes they're doing very similar things that, to what NGOs are doing, or maybe even more. <laughs> I will say that these kinds of networks are, they provided the, the I would say, the most um, extensive part of the reception in Greece last year. I mean, most of the, most of the people doing their like, on-the-ground reception work were volunteers, I would say. Um, and I think that's pretty extraordinary. Um, but, they, but they're very insistent. We're not humanitarianism. We're not charity. We're not paid for our work. Sometimes, I, I, one of my still says they don't even have a bank account. They didn't have electricity for a long time. This is about solidarity with the other because we're all in the same boat. And so, you know, and, some, some, and, and so it's interesting to see, like, why? Why is that so important? What does that mean to people? Um, and, and what kind of alternatives are they trying to propose? And you know, I really admire the solidarity movement. I also think, I, I also need to think about it critically. Mm. So you know, sometimes solidarity fails, but it's precisely working in that space of failure that I think it's, it's precisely so interesting. But do you, think, do you think we can learn something from the Greece, from the example in Greece in terms of, I mean, just picking yeah, up on that point about the state and volunteers, it just made me think about, you know, it, it must also depend on where you're coming from. Um, because mm -hmm. in a lot of countries, a lot of the work with refugees is done by the state, mm -hmm. and there's an expectation that the state will look after resettled refugees yeah. or refugees arriving. Yeah. In other places, there isn't, and there's very much an expectation that mm -hmm. ordinary citizens, if they so choose to, will pick up the slack. Yeah. And, and whether, you know, sometimes as neoliberalism has created that sort of mm -hmm. diminishing of the state and mm -hmm. the services, in other cases it's cultural or it's, um, it has a, a whole raft of mm -hmm. reasons why there are yeah. no services in place. Well, and Greece is a really interesting, interesting example because I, you know, having done my earlier work on NGOs, the NGO, people would actually think it was a state office. Mm. And now would often, and they'd be like, we're not the state. We're doing the stuff the state should be doing, but isn't. Mm. And then in the solidarity context, people say, we're not NGOs. We're not paid for this. We're not using money, right? Sometimes NGOs aren't paid, let me be honest. But, um, but, but people frequently think that they're in the NGO. <laughs> so there's this kind of, what's interesting in Greece is, you know, it's not like Greece ever had this really, really, really robust state that was distributing social services in a hugely efficient and meaningful way. However, with austerity, people I think have started to be like, wow, that was better than we thought it was. And then secondly, um, you know, people have been fighting in Europe and also for the world. Like we have labor movements, global labor, where people actually have fought for the little bit of, you know, labor rights or pension or wage increases, right? And, and, and with, ne with neoliberalism and austerity being a neoliberal set of policies, people are like, wow, this is, this is an under threat. The social state, the idea that the state can fulfill, like, that can, can speak to the needs of its people, whether they're citizens or people who need protection, is under threat. And I think, in a, in a very meaningful, I mean, very intense way. And you, you've talked a lot about care, and care has become a bit of a, a buzzword too. How, how has the issue of care changed? You're talking about the state. NGOs, okay. volunteers, mm -hmm. and your new project looking at the, the pharmacies mm -hmm. and, and the, the redistribution of, mm -hmm. of medicine. Has, has there been uh, a change in attitude towards caring for refugees or caring for the other? Yes. Because um, also you've written about, you know, in Greece, the other is, is a very important figure mm -hmm. in terms for, for the state, mm -hmm. for the polis, for... Mm -hmm. for um, it's nice the, to have an outsider, you know? The, the imagination yeah. Of, yeah. of who it is we are yes. is how we treat the other. Yes. And, and, and so, yeah, how, how does care figure in or the, yeah. the difference in, in how we care for, for them? So, um, what, what I think, one of the things that's happening in, in the solidarity movement, and it's interesting because it, 
people have been talking about solidarity for a very long time. It's not that it came out of nowhere, but let's say 15 years ago, like it was very sort of restricted in Greece to a very radical left, even anarchic, anarchist kinds of um, area, right? Now it's like people like my mom are doing this work, um, or my grandmother, <laughs> well, um, people who are 80, 82, um, so like older people, unemployed people, people who never necessarily saw themselves as being political or even thinking about doing this kind of thing. So that, that's the kind of unprecedented, at least in my experience in Greece, um, uh, aspect of the, of the solidarity movement. Solidarity is an attempt to provide care, okay, let's say, or assistance, help, voithia in Greek, like help to somebody who might be your neighbor, it might be a refugee, it might be someone like a drug addict, right? And you might have whatever your problems are with people, okay? Um, without simultaneously making them less than you. Mm. And one of, I think, one of the things that's becoming, you know, solidarity, we say we're all in the same boat, like I could be in your place, where people even sometimes, there are some groups that actually refer to um, the people who receive assistance, let's say, or help from their network as volunteers too. Mm -hmm. Because the idea is that we're all participating, you know, I'm gaining something through my participation in this. One question though is whether there, I have, is whether there's something about this assistance relationship that still, I'm pretty sure there is actually, that, that actually does put somebody potentially in a position that's less. Because there are these hierarchies, you know, you give someone a gift and they become a recipient, you know, and so, and, and so, indebted. exactly, mm -hmm. and so you've got debt, right, we have a country that's trying to deal with the idea of debt, and if, a lot of the, most of these places don't deal with uh, networks don't deal in money because money <laughs> is about debt and it can people in corruption right so and and, and for instance i just wrote a, a an article the other day and uh, for more public venue and one of my interlock one of my research participants kept saying you can't talk about donations because the medicines are not donations and I was kind of insistent, well, you know, it doesn't mean that it's like a monetary donation. It's like, no, no, they're not donations because that would make us charity. We're not charity. So, so what, what term does he use? He called them solidarity. Oh. And, um, you know, but there's no good word. I think that's the issue. And sometimes people talk about them as donations anyway. So, so they're, they're kind of, it's kind of in many ways, I'm not going to call it an impossible project, but I'd say it's a very difficult one. Um, for this very reason, because there's something about that gift relationship, especially in Greece, um, which has a very strong gift economy, that breaks through and these hierarchies persist, even in these spaces that are about trying to you know, maintain radical forms of equality. So, but, but I think that's really interesting in terms of, you know, solidarity is, is a process. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a group of people potentially, but, but he's also making into the materiality of of, a, of yes. a thing. Well, and it's interesting because solidarity, as it was practiced, I, you know, um, in Greece and other places, I think in, in Europe, it was all it was about solidarity. It's about like my, I'm going to support you, you know, politically or right this almost like emotional thing, mm. not like here's some medicine. But now you have real needs and material needs, and they're dealing with the fact that you know it's solidarity. But how do we, how do we also manage with the fact that you need like psychopharmaceuticals or cancer medicine and I'm going to do the work that's going to you know allow you to have it but do you think it's also a recognition of the um, you know words are not enough anymore so mm -hmm. a lot of the support although it might have been mm -hmm. also psychological support in a movement mm -hmm. but um, certainly with refugees I work with words are not enough when they have to work oh, yeah. they have to support themselves there's no help mm -hmm. for them from the state or from other agencies so they need material things, you know. The material life is is a necessity. Yes, absolutely. And so, and so words, often, especially well-meaning words, are nice, mm -hmm. but in 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 these uh, extreme situations, mm -hmm. they're often not enough. Absolutely, and I think I mean what's one thing that's amazing is is how well. First of all, I think what's amazing. I want to just clarify that in terms of solidarity, people working in these in doing this kind of work know all of the things I'm saying. I mean, they're hyper self-critical, hyper aware, and working really hard to continue in this very difficult project of providing assistance in a way that doesn't demean other people, because that's really what, what's at its core. So, um, and that's pretty amazing, looking at how people manage that and deal with that. Um, but the second thing is the amount of stuff 
that people have been able to mobilize. Mm -hmm. I mean, and in fact, sometimes too much stuff. So on Lesbos Island, where there was this enormous <laughs> number of, of donations, I mean, they had too much stuff. At, and this is an island, so it was like, stop sending, stop sending X, Y, and Z. Even medical supplies, not just clothes, which are a problem everywhere. People give their old clothes away that no one wants. I mean, things like, you know, we we're set with diapers, we're set with baby formula, you know, we really need X or Y. And so even um, this sort of squatted place in Athens um, where there was a hotel that was uh, squatted and, and is, has been housing refugees in a really good conditions, I mean, every day they're like, this is what we accept. So it's, it, but it's amazing how they've been, these networks have been able to just, just mobilize resources. And they don't just come from within Greece. They, I, I've also been doing fieldwork in Italy and looking at how Italians and Greeks in the diaspora have been, you know, don't uh, find, finding ways to bring, <laughs> deliver pharmaceuticals and other items to Greece. So it's pretty amazing, actually, I have to say. And so in terms of the lessons for the US right now, I think it's pretty amazing to think about you know, these are people, for instance, old people who thought that they would never have to deal with famine in the way that they had to after, you know, during and after the Second World War, who worked really hard to try to create a, a, a futures for their children and grandchildren. You have young people who <laughs> don't have a sense of any kind of future. And I think that's, that's increasingly becoming the kind of world that many, many of us are living in. Some people have always lived in that world. So it's pretty extraordinary to see what can happen when people hit, start to hit rock bottom. So I'm thinking that's something. I also think that this idea of being able to help your neighbor or help someone who is close to you, and maybe you don't agree with them, maybe you, <laughs> but, but, but they're, they're, they're part of your society, part of your community, and I think that's also incredibly inspiring um, to me. So I think it, there, the people in, in Greece have become engaged with each other in a way that they were not 10 years ago. Um, and I'm hoping, I think there is a lesson there for for the rest of the world. Maybe the rest of the world. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much for talking thank to you. us. It was very, very interesting. Okay, thank you.